it's uh it's fun to introduce your own family but my son's our speaker today he is the uh, international sales director for luxco uh, incorporated and i know most of you are sitting there saying who's luxco when he finishes you'll know <laughs> greg Good afternoon. Uh, glad to see everybody out here. How many whiskey enthusiasts do we have? All right, well, so we're gonna get this started with, we're gonna test your knowledge real quick. In the word Gaelic, what does whiskey actually translate to? You got it. There, this guy's a winner here. You got your That is absolutely correct. I think all of us have. Uh, can I, can you hear me if I talk? I got to move around when I when I present. So um, there is somebody that knows what he's talking about. Uh, whiskey light, hence the name. It's Uska Badha in actually Gaelic, right? Which is where whiskey uh, came from back in the day with the Scots and the Irish. Um, I think we've all consumed it. It can be water of life or water of death, depending on uh, how, how happy hour turned out last night for you guys. Um, what I'm gonna do is take you through what I call my master class. When I travel around the world and I present to importers or wait staffs of the four seasons or things like that and educate them on bourbon, about bourbon and so forth and so on. I don't have a ton of time today, so I'm gonna go through the history part of it more than maybe my products normally would. I'm happy to talk later about products, production, all the kind of things that you want to talk about. But um, generally, there's a lot of stuff that people don't really understand when it comes to bourbon specifically. And its origins do step back to the days of monks in, in Ireland and Scotland, uh, when they started to uh, mess around with different with the water of life and, and create different um, versions thereof. The origins in the United States happened right around the turn of the century as the pioneers started to move over from Europe and, and come over. Captain James Thorpe uh, from Britain uh, is a, has a documented letter um, that's in the archives that talks about having drank this corn-based product in the United States that he felt was better than English beer. Um, and so that's kind of the first documented proof that we have of, of an American version of a whiskey happening. Um, and furthermore, and I'm sorry that the screen's not coming on there, one of the other things that started out, because Indians were fermenting actually the corn, um, and what early settlers figured out to do in order to preserve their corn stocks for the next year, or have a tradable commodity in the future years, they started to ferment it into a liquid because then they could store it and it would be available for trading uh, the next year. So, so they didn't have to have their stocks rot and, and lose all that intrinsic value. So little by little, fermenting grain, creating liquid from it, uh, preserving it in some cases started to happen, you know, in those early days. The real first sort of documented like, okay, let's get after it boys, let's start making whiskey in America, as did the creation of America happens is the British deciding to tax things uh, on us. And in particular, the molasses trade uh, in, the, in the 1700s was very robust on the way to England and it would stop in the ports in Boston and everywhere else. And the Brits didn't want to see that not get taxed. And so they slapped the molasses tax uh, on, on we then um, subservience to the, the crown. And we didn't like that, which is no surprise. And so suddenly a lot of industrious Americans started to say, all right, well, we're gonna quit making rum because molasses is basically the principal, um, uh, uh, principal ingredient in making rum. So we started to use the corn that we had to start making our own whiskey. So thanks to the molasses tax, which then led on to other things relative to the revolution, you've probably heard of, of, of uh, the whiskey tax and things like that later that pushed people to Kentucky to avoid paying American tax. That's a different story. But the point being is that the Brits sort of brought it on themselves, right? Which also helped create some of the fine, the fine liquids that we have here today and, and work with. Um, our, our first president was also a distiller. Uh, a proud one, and he discovered, ironically, and I don't know if you guys ever noticed that, if you do drink a little whiskey, you get a little tougher. Um, and so he would serve that to our troops, actually, uh, certainly during during the wars of the day, and is quoted as saying as such, you know, that 
he found people to be a little more robust, a little more courageous once they had uh, a couple shots of whiskey in there. Um, obviously, as, um, as uh, more and more immigrants started to come over, as we got closer to establishing our republic, um, a lot more Scott, a lot more Irishmen started to show up with a little more skills in actually distilling. And they in turn helped to create um, what we know today as the industry, and in particular, why it's all based in Kentucky. Uh, Daniel Boone, uh, not a fictitious character, actually, uh, as, the, as we started to move west and mess around with, with the areas of the Louisiana Purchase from the French and stuff, he discovered the area of what's now Kentucky and found it to be you know, plentiful in terms of the ability to grow crops. It had rivers nearby, had good water sources, and reported this back, obviously, to everybody out east and said, hey, we need to do this. So several industrious people, developers of their day, uh, started to buy big plots of land, and they would offer uh, John Bard or William Bard, if I get that, yeah, William Bard, uh, offered to people, hey, if you move out to Kentucky in my, where, I, where my area is, and you develop your land, you clear it, you farm it, I'll give it to you for free. And so consequently, people started to do that. People of the name Bean, of the name Weller, of the name Evan Williams, of the name um, uh, Samuels, who are all the founding fathers of our bourbon industry today, moved to Kentucky to do exactly that. And what they found was also liquid gold, because when they dug into the well water, Kentucky, as well as our cousins in Tennessee, and I'll get to the Tennessee folks in a little bit, uh, when they dug in, at the time, the well water that came up sits on an aquifer, a limestone aquifer. And the reason that is very significant, and the reason why most of the bourbon in the United States is made in Kentucky today, is exactly for that reason. That water is very low in iron, very high in acidity, and it ferments exceptionally well and gives off an unbelievable flavor. So when those folks from Ireland and Scotland, and in some cases in the beans case, Germany, I showed up there and started to distill. They're like, wow, the flavor profiles that I get out of this fermentation in my fermentation tanks is unbelievable. I'm not moving anywhere else. We're setting up shop here. And that is why today, Kentucky is where about 95% of all the bourbon, uh, bourbon is made uh, in the United States and in the world, for that matter, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, I think I covered all those points. Um, so how Kentucky and bourbon became associated, you understand why it was founded there, but how it really became associated is that as these uh, pioneers started to <laughs> ferment it and make the liquid, well, they needed to transport. So there's a couple of wives tales, you know, the, the Reverend Elijah Craig, which a bourbon brand is named after today, allegedly had a church burned down. So they took the wood from the burnt church and made barrels out of it in order to store their whiskey. And then they found when they took the liquid out, six months, a year later, it had really good flavor and really good color. You know, the color that you see in a bourbon bottle is nothing other than the char off of the wood barrel. So we char this wood up, you put, the, you put a white looking, water looking liquid into a barrel with this kind of char, and four years later, this is what it comes out looking like. And so they discovered that by accident. Now the Elijah Craig thing can't be proven, but the, point, the thing that is proven is that when they started to create wood vessels and put the liquid in there and transport it, say, down to New Orleans, where the name Bourbon Street come from, it, the, the liquid that came out had more flavor, it was interesting, and it really developed the idea of this aging process for, for, for whiskey. Um, and so little by little, that, that's how we got also to doing that. Those barrels that would show up, say in Louisiana, in New Orleans, would have stamped on the side Kentucky and Bourbon, because it was coming from then Bourbon County, which was a massive county at the time. It no longer exists, uh, it, it, it's now, it's been divided up, but back in that time, it was Bourbon County. So it said Bourbon County, Kentucky. So everyone wanted the Bourbon, they want the Kentucky Bourbon barrels. That's the one that I want. I don't want that Indiana, or I don't want that, you know, Pennsylvania rye. I want that Kentucky Bourbon. And that's how it became sort of its own branding, right? And now today, the two are somewhat synonymous. In fact, most of you may or may not be surprised to know that you can make bourbon anywhere in the 50 United States. However, because of the reasons that I decided, historical reasons about it, 95% of that is all basically because of Jim Bean. Basically, 95% of it is all done in Kentucky. Um, but you can do it in any state. And we were talking earlier, somebody was talking about, you know, there's a lot of distilleries still in Illinois. All 50 do produce a bourbon um, that I'm aware of. So to that end, yeah, I think I covered all that too. To that end, bourbon is a uniquely American product. One of the very few that you can only make in America. It's not a trademark in America, and you can go make it in... France or go make it in South Korea, you have to make it in the United States and put bourbon on the label. If not, 
It's a whiskey. So as the phrase goes here, bourbon is a whiskey, but whiskey is not a bourbon. So in order to be a bourbon, the United States Congress in 1964 passed a law making, again, and I cannot find anything else that's other than some food items that are distinctly American, can only be made in America. <clears throat> Champagne has sort of the same trademark, if you will, for sparkling wine that's made in France in the Champagne region can be called Champagne. If you make sparkling wine anywhere else in the world, you cannot use, you can use the word Champagne, but you have to put underneath it a sparkling wine of California or a sparkling wine of, of Australia or the Italians call it Prosecco. Champagne, essentially, with different grape types, but, but that process. Cognac is the same thing. Cognac is brandy, but Cognac can only be made in the Cognac region of France. Bourbon? can only be made in the 50 United States. And it has to follow some of these other rules that are up here. The first three are the ones that are most important. It has to be a minimum of 51% corn, which is what makes bourbon different than Ireland and Scottish whiskeys, because they use malted barleys in different grain types, at least in their single malts. Um, American whiskey has to be a minimum of 51% or bourbon, excuse me. American bourbon has to be 51% corn at a minimum, it has to be aged in uh, new first use oak. We can only use our barrels one time. After we get done using them, we sell them to Scotland or we sell them to Mexico, they, they age tequila. We can't use it a second time and call it a bourbon. We could call it a whiskey, can't call it a bourbon. So the secondary market on bourbon barrels, if you've ever toured Scotland, um, and if they haven't remarked the heads on the barrels, you'll see Jim Beam, Jack Daniels, Lux Row, uh, Heaven Hill uh, <laughs> on the barrels themselves. Yeah, you have a question. Why can't you use it other than the wine? You, no, you can, and you just you can't call it a bourbon. It Why? no longer loses the designation of bourbon. Why? Just because, because the U.S. Congress, Congress says so. Why wouldn't you just use, just use the same barrel and still call it bourbon? Use the same barrel and then they just want to say have a team with a barrel manufacturer? No. I think it's to create a distinct regional and preserve the, the quality cues of the product itself. So it's <laughs> Well, I, I don't know that Congress, you know, back in 1964, other than that law. What's that? Sorry, other than the law that says you can't use the barrel. I don't. <laughs> no, you can still use the barrel. You I understand. Just, yeah. You can't call it bourbon. So you but I mean, no. you lose some of the flavor the second time? Yes. Okay. Well, definitely. There's the barrel. Definitely. No, it changes anytime you use something twice, yeah. right? I mean, you know, if you, let, if you let your hamburger sit out for a long period of time, it cools down. It's not the same burger as it was when it came out warm, right? <laughs> the second you use burger. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you want one fresh. So, you know, so be it. So um, it has created a scam, although a boom for our, a boom for our region. Most of, uh, I would say about 85% of all of the bourbon barrels that are made are made here, in, well, not here, but in the Ozarks and in Arkansas because it's that Missouri, that white oak that's used. And so the largest barrel manufacturers in the, actually the largest barrel manufacturer in the world is actually the same as a Missouri-based company. Um, uh, and so independent state company. And so it has created, a, you know, a, a, which also has made American barrels uh, an industry to themselves in terms of, of, of doing that sort of thing. So there's some, there's some ancillary opportunities that have come from it, right? So, but more importantly, it's also created this like unique proposition that, 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 that allows it to happen. Um, and, uh, and okay, it has, to be, it, it has to be done in any of the 50 US states. Again, it doesn't have to be Kentucky, but as the reasons I cited before, 95% of it is all done in Kentucky. So, um, which, is, which is a really interesting thing. A couple other really fun facts I think about um, Kentucky, uh, about it in particular, and I pulled these out from recent things, so I might share the screen. We, they, right now, there are 9 million barrels of bourbon laid down in Kentucky, which means for Kentuckians, uh, each of them could have two barrels apiece because Kentucky has about 4 million people in it. So that's pretty good. For the first time ever, over a half million, I think, uh, were laid down last year in, in one given year. Or no, more than that, like 5 million barrels were laid down in a year. So um, it's, it's uh, about 50, uh, 56. So it's a 56 gallon barrel, 200 liters. Um, it's, got, it's got its own standard size. Um, uh, it generates, uh, you know, for the state of Kentucky, well, bourbon in general, but most of it again, 95% of Kentucky, about $8.6 billion boom for, um, you know, the state of Kentucky, which is quite a nice tax bill. You know, alcohol is probably the most taxed product that's sold around the world, but in the United States too. You know, of, of your bottle of bourbon, even if it's a $10 or $11 bottle, about $7 of that is taxed. 
um, which is a big part of the actual cost of the product. You get taxed at production, you get taxed at distribution, uh, and then obviously there's sales tax on it when it's sold at retail, right? So there, 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 a lot of people, well, the government has its hands in a lot of the, a lot of the, which is, which is why we rebelled against the molasses tax, right? Um, and we exported uh, last year, I'm about to show you another statistic, which is not so enthusiastic at the moment. We exported, which is really where my purview is. I'm responsible for everything outside the United States um, in terms of our, our production and the things that we do. Um, but we did export about $400 million worth of, uh, of, of bourbon, Kentucky bourbon, uh, out of the United States. Here, here's where the bourbon industry on an export level. Now bear in mind, export is probably only about 12% um, uh, of the total amount of, of whiskey. Uh, most of it is consumed here in the United States uh, by Beans, by Brown Foreman, which is the parent company to Jack Daniels and stuff like that. So that blue line is total whiskey, which includes my friends with the name Jack on their label. Uh, the brown line is actually the bourbon thing. The last few years we've suffered a little because unfortunately we got wrapped up into um, the United States government and, and the European Union getting into a little tussle over aluminum. And they decided to throw bourbon into the mix is, is an unfortunate thing. And that tariff has really hurt a lot of, a lot of it. As you see, we're down about 50, uh, a little short of like a 50% drop um, or, or a 33% drop over the last few years. Now, I think that's about to get better for us, which is good, but we'll see, fingers crossed, right? So uh, it, it, it's, it's bad for our American industry, but hopefully we'll, we'll get that all figured out. One of the things that I want to circle back to is um, Jack Daniels. And this is just for your own little trivial purposes, or if you're sitting at a bar one night and somebody goes, yeah, I'll have a bourbon, give me Jack Daniels. Well, Jack Daniels is not a bourbon. Does anybody know why? Yes, sir. That's right. So Jack Daniels, again, those laws that I, that I showed you that, that Congress in 1964 passed said that there is no extra flavor profiles that you're allowed to do to a bourbon. You're allowed the grain, you're allowed the yeast, you're allowed the water, and you're allowed the barrel. That's all that can flavor a bourbon. If you do anything else in that process, uh, before you age the liquid, it cannot be a bourbon. Our friends in Tennessee do a Lincoln County process uh, filtering when the di distillate comes off the still, which is a maple charcoal filtering, before it goes in the barrel. They add a flavor profile to it, which is their own characteristic. And in fact, actually, they own a trademark called the ten Tennessee whiskey, similar to the way bourbon is. They, have, they keep lobbying Congress to pass a law like ours on Tennessee whiskey. They haven't done it yet, but they'll get there. But so that's a unique proposition. So that Jack Daniels is not a bourbon by that for that reason. However, it is made just like that. The same thing. It's principally corn. They use rye and they use malted barley to do it. So, um, but uh, that's that, that's exactly right. A lot of people don't realize that, but that's not the case. So, with that, um, I probably have a few more minutes. I'm gonna get into the company I work for, which is uh, Luxco. We are a St. Louis-based company. Been in the business for over 63 years. Uh, been on the private label side forever. We make Pearl Vodka, we make Everclear, we make Juarez Tequila. Um, and more recently in the last, in, in the seven years that I've been involved with the company, we were family owned and operated by the, the, the Lux family themselves. And we built the distillery down in Kentucky about six years ago at this point. We acquired other distilleries over the years. We have two distilleries in, in Kentucky and I'm gonna get into those in just a second. Lux Row and Limestone Branch. We own a distillery down in Mexico where we make our tequilas. We're not talking about tequila today, but we do do tequilas. And we actually own a production facility in, in Derry, Ireland, where we make Irish cream and Irish whiskey. Um, uh, but um, over the years, we've done a, a bunch of things. And more recently, the Lux family uh, cash, cashed in uh, the private company. We, now, we are now part of uh, MGP Ingredients, uh, which is one of the largest, is the largest uh, this, um, contract distiller in the United States, actually for gin and vodkas. Um, and they bought us to take on our brands. So the Lux family is still involved. They are the largest shareholder now of the company. Um, specifically about our, um, our facilities as it relates to um, whiskeys, the crown jewel of our, our portfolio is Luxor Distillery. We were talking earlier, it is part of the Bourbon Trail. It's one of the 14 that are. So if you go down to, to, to Louisville, uh, we were talking earlier, somebody was gonna do that in a couple of weeks. Uh, and get your bourbon passport. Let's roll with one of them. Uh, it is a facility that can do about right now 28,000 barrels a year. Uh, we are actually outgrowing our production at the moment. So we are going to, or our sales are outgrowing our, our, our ability to produce. So we will be doubling that up in the next few years. And we built the distillery with that in mind. Uh, we have the capacity to house about 120,000 barrels on the property once we build the, the, the sixth rick house. 
Rick House is a industry term for a barn uh, with a roof over it where we, where we, we build rector set type, um, uh, rector set type um, uh, closets, if you will, where the barrels sit and, and age. Um, and right now we have five on the property. We probably have an excess, I think I put up there 80,000 barrels. Yeah, 80,000 barrels on the property now. We will eventually get to 120 when we'll age capacity, right? So obviously you gotta age those um, for, for, for four years for it to be a proper bourbon. One of the details I did not go into in the rules of bourbon that if a bourbon does not have an age statement on it, it means it's been aged a minimum of four years. So if it says Kentucky Street bourbon whiskey on it, a minimum it's been aged four years. A lot of us start to put age statements at year six and seven on there. So you often see things old Ezra seven or, or Elijah Craig six or something like that. If it has less than four, but more than two, you have to put an age statement somewhere on the list. So technically to be a Kentucky Street bourbon whiskey, it has to age two years with all the rules we talked about in brand new American oak and, and, and grain and then all that has to hit the, hit the number point. But somewhere on there it has to say age two or three years. Once you get to four, you no longer have to put that on the list. Which I think is a mistake internationally. It's one of the things I fight with our marketing group about because a lot of Scotch blended whiskeys are only three years old. So in theory, bourbon is aged even longer. The other thing, if you're a big Scotch whiskey fan, this is another thing that I bring up a lot, is that aging in Kentucky in general, and particularly at Lux Row, um, is sort of like the way you calculate the life, the, the, the years, in human years, the, the, the years of your dog. Kentucky, because we do not um, climate control our rick houses, for the most part. There are people that experiment with this, but we do not. Allow it to sit out in heat like today. So if we're down at Lux Road down in Bardstown today, and we go into that Rick House, and, and all you guys that raised your hand that are bourbon fans, you'll die and go to heaven because the angel share, which is the the evaporation piece that happens inside the barrel rooms, is glorious on a day like today because those barrels are just sweating out whiskey, right? Um, but in the winter, they cool down. So you get you get that evaporation and then some days condensation depending on where the rick is. And if we go about six stories high, so the ones up in the attic of the rick house sweat and evaporate a ton, and they have more alcohol than the ones down below. So when we come to the blending process and we create specialized whiskeys, that, that allows that blender to do a lot of very few things. So that barrel from up top is very different from that barrel downtown, down below. In Scotland, they age them in caves or, or and if you've been to Scotland, if anyone had the experience of doing so, it's, it's kind of, uh, it never gets over 70 degrees, it's cold, it rains all the time. So their barrels, for what we can do in four years, is the equivalent of like 12 in Scotland. That's why you don't see, a, it's impossible to have a bourbon, honestly, over 25 years, and 23, because there's no liquid left in it, it's all evaporated. We have 10 year old barrels sometimes that don't have very much liquid left in it because of that reason. Uh, whereas in Scotland, it'll sit there forever because it never gets hot enough to evaporate. Right? It's also why that color content's a little different. So, um, a little fun fact for you. So, out of Lux Row, we produce, and I'm running out of time. So, if you're giving me the, all right, I'm, I got, I got the wink. I'm good. Uh, we produce uh, four or five different brands. Um, our our premier brand is Rebel. Uh, Rebel is a weeded bourbon. Uh, weeded means refer to a weeded versus a rye bourbon, not a rye whiskey, but a rye bourbon. A weeded bourbon is one that uses all right, the first grain, as we've just all found out, has to be corn, 51%. The second grain that is used in probably 85% of all, all bourbons is rye. Rebel uses wheat, so it's actually 68% corn, 20% wheat, and 12% malted barley. We all use malted barley uh, because it, it releases enzymes in the fermentation tank that allows the yeast to do its job to create those grains, the starches, and the sugars before we put it into the still to make the whiskey. So uh, Rebel's unique uh, in the sense that it is a weeded bourbon. Pappy Van Winkle's a weeded bourbon. Old Fitzgerald is a weeded bourbon. Larceny is a weeded bourbon. And the Weller brands are all weeded bourbons. They're all tied together because they all came from the same distillery back in 1849. And that distillery didn't make it, uh, or it successfully didn't make it in the 90s when the bourbon and the whiskey business sort of took a, took a really dark, deep backseat to vodka trend that happened in the 90s. And those, a lot of distilleries went under. So a lot of brands became for sale and companies like ours, companies like Kevin Hill, companies like Sazerac ended up buying pieces of it. The Sazerac company has the Pappy and the Weller. We have Rebel and our friends at Heaven Hill have Old Fitzgerald and Larceny. Um, but it's a unique uh, strand and we like to refer to this as the poor man's Pappy Van Winkle. We make, uh, we, make, we make a rye whiskey. Now the rye whiskey is not made in, that's an Indiana rye. So that we don't make our rye, but we do make the bourbons. 
and we have a all award winning. Uh, we have a 10 year old single barrel that if you can find it over at Friar Tuck, buy it because it is my favorite product of what we make and, and one of the best that we have. We have a whole range of bourbons. We also do barrel picks uh, occasionally, places like Friar Tuck or um, even Deerberg or Schnook sometimes will do barrel selections on that. And that it's a very personalized single barrel bottling. We also do another brand, which we're doing a lot of advertising here in St. Louis about Ezra Brooks. Now this is a rye mash bill bourbon. So instead of that second grain being wheat, in this case, it's a rye, so a little spicier. The wheat, by the way, makes it a little smoother, a little simpler to drink and so forth and so on. I won't go into this history. Um, we also do a product called Davis County. Uh, out of, and this is a unique bourbon in the sense that we take our weeded mash bill, and mash bill is, a, again, a techie term. If I'm playing, if you guys are playing uh, whiskey bingo, I just hit them all, right? Between Rick House, mash bill. Mash bill is our recipe. It's, it's, it's the bringing together the grains to create the mash where we ferment to create the alcohol. In this case, we combine two different mash bills. We're creating our weeded mash bill, which is kind of the rebel mash bill, and our Ezra Brooks mash bill, bring them together and create a Kentucky Street bourbon. So it's what we call a four grain bourbon. Most are three, this one is a four. And then we do two extra things to it. We do a secondary finish. We put some of the liquid into a uh, Cabernet cask out of Napa. It's like a use of third use, I'm not sure on that one in terms of the wine. And then a French toast, toasted barrel. So we bought French oak out of France and, and done a secondary finish. So those are those two labels, the, the, the blue and the, the red labels on that. We just recently released this as a, as a new uh, product. And Give me the one last thing I'm gonna to skip to really quick. The little jewel, the little jewel that we have in our portfolio, and I'm gonna and, I, and I'm gonna and I'll leave it with this, uh, and I'll just leave it on a, a picture of the product. Um, we acquired before we actually built Lux Row, we acquired a micro distillery in Kentucky, in Lebanon, Kentucky, owned by Stephen Paul Bean, yes, of the Jim Bean family, seventh generation of the family members. At the time when we acquired them, and up until our recent merger with the publicly traded company. It was the only distillery in Kentucky that a Bean family member actually owned and actually distilled them. Uh, there are Bean family members that do work at the Jim Bean company, but Jim Bean, and then maybe a spoiler alert here, is actually owned by a Japanese company today. It's not even an American company anymore. It's Bean Suntory that actually owns it. So uh, these two were wanted to bring back that heritage and brought Paul and Steve brought it back. One of the brands in our portfolio when we made the acquisition to buy them was a, a product called Yellowstone. Yellowstone had been part of their family before Prohibition. So we, we gave him back the brand, or we, if you want to do, re redid it. And he has gone back and actually taken a yeast jug from his family that was in the uh, Bourbon Historical Museum in Bardstown, Kentucky, swabbed it, took it to the University of Louisville. They did the DNA and found the yeast strand that was being used before Prohibition to make the Yellowstone burger. So he's back making it like his family did before. At one point, this is one of the best-selling bourbons uh, in the United States in the 1960s. And in fact, was actually part of uh, the mint julep at the Kentucky Derby before that became a commercialized proposition where you pay to play to Woodford today, which is pretty good, uh, is, is the official bourbon of the mint julep at the Kentucky Derby. Prior to that, way back before everything, you know, we got to the corporate sponsorship days, uh, Yellowstone was part of that. So beautiful, if you're gonna do a micro distillery, it's part of the, the um, it's part of the bourbon trail, the craft bourbon trail. It's a great tour because they're very small. We only produce two barrels a day. It's a very small operation. It's not like some of the other places you're going to see in Kentucky to do anything. And then you're getting a piece of heritage too because you're actually talking to a Bean family member. If you happen to find Steve at the distillery, right there. so with that, I know I'm getting yeah. Yeah. So, well, today with the merger, we're now the fourth largest. Yeah, we're the fourth largest whiskey producer in the United States today. Obviously, we're ways behind both Beam and, 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 and Well, it doesn't matter. We're, that's a parent company. What matters is the brand, right? And the, and the liquid in the bottle. When you so. mentioned uh, that there was liquid gold in Kentucky, the bankers all started to jump up. <laughs> <laughs> thought they were going to leave. Any questions from Greg? I have one. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you, in, the temperature is not controlled. Yes. So, so yeah. it's not going to, like, we have one of our facilities that freezes in St. Louis, it's not going to freeze. Well, no, it's alcohol, right? So it goes into the barrel at 80% uh, alcohol, which won't freeze. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. That's where it's on my body. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's why we get that. Anything over 80% alcohol or 40% alcohol, you know, if I could say you 40% alcohol. These are 100, it goes into the barrel uh, at 100, actually, the, 
one of the other rules is it has to, when we put it in the barrel, we can't put it in with an alcohol over 125 proof. So it's 70 or a 60 proof mass, 62 and a half percent alcohol uh, when it goes into the barrel. So sometimes it comes out higher because it evaporates, the water evaporates out. A lot of barrels that are 129 proof or you know, over almost 65%. Does do anything on uh, so that's when they made the comment. No, you know, we should, and I, I, internationally, I'm going to start to play that up a little bit yeah. more. You know, um, Bourbon Heritage Month is in September. There's a lot that's done with that, but um, it's, it's usually acknowledged, but probably not as much as we should. Yeah. It, it is a good marketing So, what's the next step in the that makes it for a The label. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here's what I'll say, um, because we do have a product that's related and, and at least at the core of it is the same. You know, in my opinion of Pappy, the 15 year old is fantastic. I think once you get, per this again, this is a personal, once you get over 15 years because of this aging process I just described to you with bourbons, I find them to get very woody and overcome the flavor of, of the actual um, What's beautiful about bourbon, whether it be kind of a spicy or, or a sweeter kind of, is you get more of a wood effect to it. Like, I don't know if you ever had an over oaked Chardonnay where it just tastes too woody. I find that the Patty 20 and 23, which is the one that goes for, well, if you found an $800, I'd buy it five because you could flip it for like two grand, three grand right immediately. But, um, so it's more the nuance of it. You know, it's sort of like finding that vintage Porsche, you know, um, because it is uh, it's sort of a unicorn. That's why it gets the kind of price that it's very good whiskey. But it's one of those things because it's a scarcity and I think the cult of personality of the brand has created that sort of situation. Is it worth four or five grand if you see it today at a, you know, a 23 year old? No, I have had, there are places that'll sell you a shot for like 60 bucks or a hundred bucks. And I've done that just, to, just so I could make a comment like this. And I was like, wow, that's, it doesn't taste like whiskey. It's very dark and it's very woody, you know, but that's my personal taste. So. Very pleased you're gonna do oh, sure. too, right? How hard is it to get the Yellowstone to invest in? I'm sorry, what was that again? How hard is it to buy the Yellowstone brand and how much is it? That one right there is not hard at all. In fact, if you would probably go into the airport, you're showing up certainly a prior product that select is available. Every year, Steve does do a limited edition where we put it out, actually it's coming out right now, uh, where he, he we only do about 7,000 bottles of it. He takes um, uh, seven and a nine and a 14, blends them together. And this year, we actually aged in Armanac cast. Uh, so it's got secondary finish, a limited edition. It comes in a dark bottle uh, and can signed by Steve, actually. So it's sort of like it's our version of trying to do a copy of uh, But that is readily available. That's ready all year round. And, and um, I think you'll find it right around the $39 mark. Yeah. yeah. So. Very good. Brent's got a guy out there. The back is killing him. He's got to get to <laughs> Are you going to get one of those samples here? Yeah, I, I did bring a little Rebel. Um, if anybody wants a little sample of a uh, weed bourbon, I'm happy to, to do that for you and happy to entertain any other questions you may or may not have afterwards. I'll stick around. So, thanks. <laughs>